Today's episode is with Robin Packard. Robin is the top ranking distributor at Zingular, a hundred million dollar health and wellness network marketing company. They actually had to invent her rank because no one had ever hit that rank before. Uh, she's funny, humble, hardworking, and really awesome to talk to. Uh, she lives in Texas and is a proud mother of three. Hello. Hey, Robin. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Good. You uh, you having fun playing teacher? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if it's cut out to be a teacher. Our <laughs> teachers really have done a good job. My kids do a lot on Zoom, so oh, it's yeah? been an yeah. easy transition for us. What What ages are your kids? 16, 11, and 10. Yeah, if you had to be the teacher for that, that's a lot of stuff to you have to remember. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it's nice in Texas, though, so they, they like to get done early so they can go outside and do some stuff. Yeah, the teachers are probably kind of getting sick of doing Zooms and stuff, too. Oh, I'm just ready for the school year to be over. Let's go ahead and move, forget it and move into summer. Yeah, no, totally so. I, I, I completely uh, can kind of see it from your perspective. So we're expecting our first baby um, like this week. Wow. Yeah. So it's, we're kind of, it's kind of crazy. And, and one of my biggest fears my whole life has been um, my baby growing up and needing help like on their math homework and me yeah. having to admit that I wasn't paying attention. You know, like, I, I don't know. I can't help you. <laughs> That's what I've been saying for a month now. I'm like, Google it. Google it. Ask your teacher. It's yeah. okay. I even told him the other day, you're never going to need to know what a parallelogram is. So just yeah. don't sweat it. Ask your teacher. Yeah. Hang on. Let me let my dog in. Yeah, no problem. It never fails a kid or dog interrupts a Zoom meeting oh, or any yeah. kind of Zingular or anything I do. So are you doing most of your Zingular stuff via Zoom these days? Oh uh, yeah, a lot of it, and a lot of like, uh, like video messenger videos and stuff. Yeah. I mean, we use Zoom a lot anyway, but we're definitely using it more. Yeah. You like uh, Teamsy? Yeah, I love Teamsy. It's made a big difference. Yeah, I've heard a ton of people talking about. It. I've never personally used it, but it seems like it's like a game changer. I guess. It is, and, like, there's benefits for the brand new distributor, and there's benefits for, like, a higher-level distributor um, because the higher levels, there's just a lot of people to check in with. And But what I like about for a brand new distributor, you know, it gets them in a habit of following up. It gets mm -hmm. them in a consistent, this is what income-producing activities look like. So, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'm really glad that X-Twins found that and shared that. So when you started, did they have words for all those things like income producing activities and like, did you just like, Hey, get out there. And look. Yeah. So when I started Zingular, we didn't even have like a packet in the kit. Like oh, there was just nothing. We made our own, Hey, welcome packet. This is how you do it. Like there really wasn't any marketing tools. I didn't, I didn't even know what an MLM was. I went to my first convention and someone said MLM when they were speaking and I leaned over to Kara Cunningham, who's my sponsor and said, what's an MLM? <laughs> I had no idea. I took not one business class in college. That is so funny. Well, and I'm in business school and that just kind of makes me think like, what are all these things that I'm learning all the time that I'm actually not going to use, you know, that aren't going to help me. Well, I'm sure you would use a lot of it. I mean, um, my background was just biology. I had a lot of biology classes, and um, which was helpful on the product coaching side. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, as far as sales, zero experience. I'm actually the opposite of a salesperson, I feel like. I don't know. In what way? I don't know. I guess I always grew up with this connotation that, like, a salesperson – or distributor was pushy, high pressure. Um, and I never liked that. Um, like I'm kind of naturally introverted anyway. So like the minute I'm around salespeople and like they really start pressuring me, I kind of want to withdraw and like escape. Um, so that's why right off the bat when Kara Cunningham was like, 
you should do this, you should do this. I was like, oh, I'll be horrible at that. I'll be horrible at pressuring people and like going for the kill. That's just not me. Yeah. Um, you know, but I think, I think there's just a way big difference between the culture of Zingular and like sales people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it, it shows when you're genuine and like truly want to help somebody and it's not yeah. just about a sell or a kit, you know, yeah. selling kits. No, totally. I, one thing, a question that I get a lot is, you know, like, where is the balance between being salesman yeah. and pushy um, and being, you know, a wuss and not even asking? Because some people are like, I don't want to be salesman and they want it so bad that they go too far the other way. And they're too afraid yeah. to pose or they're too afraid to ask their friends. Like, how do yeah. you how do you find that balance? Well, I mean, I think you just know, like, if you don't ask, it's always no. Um, uh, I know, like, an eye-opener for me in the very beginning, I was a distributor, but I wasn't pushing it. And um, one day my brother called me and said, hey, what's that stuff you're doing? And I told him, he goes, yeah, I just signed up under Jana Dyer. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and But then I was like, you know, you weren't putting it out there. You didn't... <clears throat> Like you didn't talk about it. You didn't like, so that's how it needed to be. And it, it just was an eye opener for me. Like, like you either got to get bold. And what I try to tell new distributors, I'm like, you know, in the beginning we were all scared. We were all scared to be turned down. And then just one day, and like, it just doesn't bother you anymore. Like one day your belief is so powerful that if you get a no, it's nothing. And what I've found is like, no, basically has always meant later for me. Yeah. Like they've always come back. I can't even remember someone that's just flat told me no and never would do it. Yeah. You know, sometimes it just takes people watching to see what you're going to do. Um, I just think you just kind of have to throw a Hail Mary and start doing it all the time until you get better at it, you know? Yeah. And you do slowly get better and your delivery gets better. And it's when people's confidence gets better that things really start to change. Like mm -hmm. when, because people can tell, I think it doesn't even matter so much the words that are coming out of your mouth when you talk mm -hmm. to people. It's like the excitement, the passion, like if they can tell if you love it, that's what people feel. You know, they might not remember a word you say. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion right right when you started did you feel confident like how long did it take you to start to feel confident no I was terrible <clears throat> so my big deal was I had a lot of faith in the products and felt very confident in talking products but I did not talk about the business because then that would mean salesy to me if I was like trying to push business on them right but when I went to my first convention and decided like I'm gonna do this I'm gonna be serious about this and do this you know, I just had to go force myself and truly it is forcing yourself. Okay. I'm going to go and I'm going to make this phone call. And I'm going to talk first about the business. You know, I'm going to say the products are great. The comp plan's great. I'm going to tell you about this business and what it's doing for me. And that's when the game radically changed for me. Mm -hmm. And then you can see after that, a lot of the people that I brought in were much more business minded and it was because I had approached them with the business more. Right. Um, I just don't ever count anybody out for the business. Like as far as products, I mean, if that's all somebody wants, that's fine. But I'm always going to continue planting that seed because it was a year before I was super interested in the business with Kara. Mm -hmm. And so I tell my distributors all the time, well, what if she would have quit? What if she would have quit talking to me about it? You know, there would never be this line of Zingular because I never would have done it. So when you feel like you're bothering people, you really need to just realize that some people take a while to marinate on it. I'm pretty hard headed. It takes me a while. It has to be my idea. <laughs> right. So it just it took you a year to basically be like, hey, this is my idea, actually. I'm, I'm going to do this for myself. Yeah, evidently I'm a really slow learner because it took me a year for me to sign up to do the products. And then it took me almost another year to like do the business yeah so i mean they're a really slow learner or just that hard-headed who on your team reminds you of yourself the most 
Um, gosh, probably Ursula, but I would say Ursula um, is better than me. Um, Ursula and I think a lot alike all the time. Um, I don't know, sometimes I think I'm kind of right in the middle of Ursula and Crystal Nichols, kind of a mix of the two of them. Uh, both are really great leaders. There's a lot of stuff I admire about both of them. I learn a lot from both of them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, probably I would probably say Ursula though. Yeah. We're the most like-minded. How do you know each other? Um, so it's kind of funny. A girl was wearing a skirt at a convention and I don't even like skirts, but I must have really wanted a skirt skirt and I kept calling Ursula and emailing her about what she ran a boutique um, and asking her about this skirt. And then finally she called me one day to tell me that she had one. And um, we got to talking about Zingular. <laughs> she was asking me, I mean, I remember she said, is the money for real? And I was like, well, it's not Monopoly money. <laughs> so she kind of gets me. She gets my sense of humor. Um, I, I've worked in sales jobs and, you know, obviously work at Zingular now. And it's, it's weird to have a, a job that mixes friendship and work. You know, yeah. like, I've never seen that anywhere else. Like your best friends you work with and, you know, because yeah. of your friends you do better. Like it's, it's kind of strange, you know? It is. It's, it's exciting too, though. It's been really fulfilling for me to watch how it's changed my friends' lives because I do remember when I did that three-way call with, or that call, not a three-way, it's just Ursula and I. When I did that call with Ursula, she said, well, it's 106 in Texas and I can't turn on my air conditioner because I can't afford it. And then to now see where she is today, I mean, that's really exciting. It makes my heart happy to see what it's done for my friends. Um, and I think that's another thing distributors have to remember when they feel like they're bothering their friends. Like, I would rather have bothered my friends and seen what the positive outcome has been today than to have never bothered them all and see them stuck in the same position they were six years ago. Yeah. So it's been six years. Um, let's see. I came in 2012. I think Crystal came in in 14. Yeah. So I think six years for her and then Ursula, maybe 15. I can't remember. It's all kind of been a big blur. And look at you now. You've got a purple blue throne in your living room. I don't know about that, but. <laughs> oh man. I love that. That's awesome. Um, I was just thinking, so six years. 2012 is that what you're saying roughly Sorry. 2012 i started the products in august of 2012 and so the business like 2013 roughly yeah i started getting interested um i had a meeting in january and i hit manager that night but i still wasn't convinced um it was really the next year so probably early in 14 that i was like okay and that's when I went to convention and was, that's what changed my mind was that convention. I was a silver director when I went to that convention and not all the way in. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and when I say all the way in, like I wasn't doing everything I knew it would probably take to be successful. The scary things. I was not doing the scary things. Um, I was basically just posting on Facebook and hoping someone would come to me and yeah. that's just not realistic. It's not, I mean, you're going to get a few signups here and there off of that, but that's not network marketing. That's not working the business. That's not going all in. What was the thing you were most, most scared of in the beginning? Um, I didn't want to be judged. I'm a really private person. So first it was really hard for me to put before and after pictures because one, I didn't want them to see my struggle. Like I felt like I kept my weight, weight problem. I mean, as hidden as I could. Yeah. Um, I didn't want my high school friends seeing how big I had gotten. And I didn't, I guess I was ashamed for my fat friends. I was a fat one, my non fat friends. I was ashamed for them to see that, hey, I'd once been thin and let myself get heavy. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, um, and then I feel like there's some judgment that you get 
for putting yourself online, you know, like, oh, she's not that thin or, oh, she didn't look that, you know, or whatever. Um, I was real hung up on that. And then just, you know, being so out there with my struggle, you know, that was kind of my private pain. But it took a friend saying, well, okay, so if you post this picture, because I remember Kara was wanting to post a before and after picture. And she actually did, and she tagged me in it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I was losing my mind. And she said, "Um, if that helps one person, wouldn't it be worth it? Like, if there was one girl, like, looking just like you and watched or saw that and it gave them hope, would that be worth 99 of them rolling their eyes and judging you? And I guess at that moment, I kind of decided, well, yeah, it would be. As long as some good can if someone can benefit from my private struggle and my pain, then it's worth it. But, um, you know, it just took me a while to come around to that. Um, and then contacting people like I didn't want to put myself that out there and, you know, be rejected or people label me as that girl selling stuff. Um, but what I tell people all the time, like, it's pretty liberating not to care. And I'm not, I'm not saying I don't care about anything. I'm saying, I don't care if somebody thinks I'm that girl on Facebook. I don't care if someone makes fun of my weight loss struggle. Um, cause those aren't the people that matter. Those people's opinions aren't, um, supporting my kids or feeding my kids. So there's something real liberating the day you just are like, yeah, I just don't care. This is my truth and this is my story and here it is. Take it or leave it. Yeah, I love that. And that's a lot harder to do than I think most people know. Yeah, um, I, I think everyone has a fear list like, oh, I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do this. Because what, what if, you know, what if I get rejected? Well, what if you do? Yeah. Like, what? What if you don't hit your goals? You're still further along than you were if you never tried. Yeah. And I found like right after you put yourself out there, um, usually it's kind of like panic. And then you realize it's really not that big a deal. And people right. are really caring and people probably scrolled past it and, you know, either didn't notice it, didn't think twice about it or like, hey, that's really cool. Um, yeah. Most people aren't haters. Well, I think most people... <clears throat> are more can relate to your struggle than they can perfection. I think there's way too much of, you know, um, perfection on social media, look a certain way, act a certain way. You know, I think, I think people can't relate to that and that's unattainable. I think what they can relate to is like struggle. And this is my, this is my story. And, you know, I'm quick to say, you know, when we are at big events and stuff, like we dress up, we wear heels, we do this. And a lot of girls do that anyway, but I don't. Like when you see me on a normal day, I mean, I have jeans on right now and a t-shirt and that's kind of my normal jam. Um, So I just, I'm hesitant to let people think that put any me or whatever up on a pedestal because like I try to be real about my struggles and, you know, let them see, because I think anyone can do this. I think I'm proof that anyone can do this. I had no sales experience. Um, I'm introverted by nature. And right away I realized, okay, if you're going to do this, you've got to get better with people. Um, and I do like people and I, you know, I love people and I care about them. But for some reason, when I'm in a big, big group, um, it kind of wears me out. Like, yeah. I don't know why, where it charges an extrovert up, like they get a big charge off of it. And me, it kind of makes me tired. And Mm -hmm. so like, I have to always remember, you know, like, like to put myself out there because I naturally tend to sit in a small group or be in a small group because that's where I'm comfortable. But from the outside looking in, you cannot do that because then people think, oh, she just wants to sit with that, you know, and that's not true. I, I want to talk to everyone. I just find it hard sometimes to make small talk and I've had to try to get better at that. Right. Right. Do you get nervous like speaking in front of people or did you? 
Um, I think probably the first time I'm sure I did. And now it really doesn't bother me. Um, I thought the video the other day I did for the, uh, virtual convention, that was harder for me because you're just talking Mm -hmm. into a camera with no feedback, you know, you don't, but then I had, I, you know, I got, I, I got good and bad reviews, not bad reviews, but I, I had a lot of people say I could relate to you a lot more just talking. And I had a friend said, I liked it much better because you weren't joking. And she said, and I, and I will joke sometimes, you know, and so I don't know. I don't know. I, I doesn't really bother me. Yeah. Hmm. I think I I don't fancy myself to be this big public speaker, but I'm not afraid of it. Right. Right. And, and I mean, at this point you've been doing it for a long time It's probably, you're probably breaking down some of the walls that you built up, you know, before you started. I wonder, so you were saying, you know, six, seven years that you've been doing the business side of it. Does it, do you ever have those moments where you just, I don't know, like where you're like, Oh, I can't believe I've done all this. I can't believe like all, all this has happened to me. Like it was only six years ago that, you know, my life was in this place. You know, it's weird you ask me that because as I was hitting ranks and people would say, like, I can't believe you're doing this, I never really felt proud of myself or anything. I was just like, well, I have a good team, you know. And then I don't think it was until I kind of built, I built a house in Texas, an indoor arena. And there was one day where I was like, man, I can't believe how far I've come because one of my private struggles is when I got divorced, my kids, we had a house, um, we had an indoor arena. And, um, when I got divorced, you know, my kids lost all that. And we had this kind of transition time where we lived in a guest house until we figured out what we're doing. And then we moved to Oklahoma for a year and we kind of knew that wasn't where we were meant to be. And then we moved to, Texas and then you know we were lived in a guest house so I told everyone like we we've lived in a lot of guest house and then finally I got to build a house and build an indoor arena and give that back to my kids Mm -hmm. and I don't know that I was proud I just felt tremendous relief to finally give them back what I felt like they had lost um they certainly had never said that to me but you know I did have a moment where I was like yeah I can't believe all this has happened and I've been, I mean, I feel grateful and so thankful for Zingular just because I'm scared to even think where we would have been without it. Yeah, definitely. How old is your youngest again? He's 10. Okay. And your oldest is 16? Yeah. Um, so she, your oldest is, what's her name again? Ryan. Ryan. Um, she has probably kind of a a better perspective on this whole journey, right? I mean, she, it started when she was maybe 10, nine or 10. Yeah. Yeah. Probably Ryan. It's been the most, um, craziest for her because, you know, when I started Zingular, I think I, I showed a slide once at convention. I think I had $32 in my checking account and $34 in my savings account. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been crazy. I'm sure she could elaborate more on it, but you know, where my little kids, they all they've ever known basically is singular since they were little. Well, this is something that me and my wife talk about all the time because, you know, we're, we talk about, Hey, let's, let's give a better life to our kids. You know, I think every generation wants to do that. Um, but this, it's kind of weird too, because a lot of the things that were hard in my life, ended up making me a better person right Um, like you don't want to rob your kids of some of the hard stuff but now that you you know you've accomplished all these things and you do have that better life like how do you now give them the right type of hard things does that make sense (laughs) yeah it makes total sense i i do believe that because my dad instilled very early on a work ethic i mean when i was in high school the minute I could get a job actually I remember being too young to have a real job and then paying me cash um (laughs) I started waitressing 
and I really wanted to buy a set of roping calves and I had to waitress all summer to save the money. And I remember how much better I took care of those roping calves, how thankful I was to have them because every dollar I made went into that. And I think that's important. And that is the one thing I really want to instill in my children is a work ethic because I think a work ethic in the world will get you really far. Some drive and motivation. Um, so like my oldest right now, she gets up and she goes to work every day. Um, she, I mean, since school is online now, she goes and goes early and works for a horse trainer every single day except Sunday. And she knows that's getting her closer to her goals. And then, you know, my little kids, same deal. Like they have to take care of their horses. They have to go down and, you know, make sure they ride them every day. Like I just always think it's important that kids like have a job, um, you know, not when they're little, but always like chores or something that they can get some satisfaction, feel like just to know that that hard work, you know, and then I want my ha kids to have a lot of compassion for people. And I try really hard to make sure that they don't feel entitled or anything. And, you know, um, give back to others. And we try to do a lot of that stuff. And that that's fun. It's a good learning experience for them. Um, but that's one thing I don't want my kids to ever lose is like compassion for other people and seeing other people struggle. I think I heard it in one of your speeches. I don't remember where it was, but you used the word, I want to say either servant leadership or serving heart or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I want my kids to grow up with a servant's heart. I think it was in my platinum executive video. I said mm. that, um, I want them to go out in the world and try to change the world, but realize like they can help a lot of people on a one person level. Like, you change the world by starting with one person, making their life better. Um, I just don't want them ever to get callous to the fact there's a lot of pain and suffering in the world that they can help. Whether whether they have any money or not much money, there's always something we can be doing. How was, uh, when you had your first boy, how was it different from your girl? We're, we're expecting a boy, so I'm looking for tips. Ah, <laughs> well, I mean, he's a mama's boy. Yeah. Um, He's harder because he's harder to keep alive. I mean, boys are just daredevils by nature. Um, you know, and then I was so shocked when he was little because I thought, oh, I'm going to dress him in all this boy stuff. And he came out harder than my girls to dress. He had more opinions, still does. If a shirt is an inch too short on his wrist, oh, he's not wearing it. Oh, that's funny. Um, but he's definitely a daredevil. He likes to rough and tumble. I mean, he rides a dirt bike. He lopes his horse around bareback crazy as fast as he can. I mean, he's just, they're just different. Where my girls are, they're definitely tomboys, but they're a little more refined. I don't really worry about them trying to do a daredevil stunt that's so dangerous they might hurt themselves. Were you like that? Were you like kind of a daredevil as a kid? Yeah, and because my brother was eight years older than me, and I felt like I was the test dummy for everything. Like, <laughs> they'd build a ramp and then have me ride my bike over it to see if it would hold or how bad he'd wreck. And I remember once he built this huge snow ramp, and on his four-wheeler, it went as fast as he could with an inner tube, and it kind of cut off and sent me over it. So, yeah, I mean, he may just get that from, I don't know, but he definitely is the adrenaline junkie in the family he likes to go fast yeah horses cars all of it all of it <laughs> dirt bike can-am horse all of it something i've thought about too is you know when when my kid's a teenager and i don't want him to do something crazy but it is something that i did you know, how am I supposed to be like, hey, don't go around stealing traffic cones and throwing them on the freeway. But actually, I did that. So how can I, you know, <laughs> how can I reconcile yeah. stuff that I did? Well, you try. I don't know. I don't know how we do that. I'm going to have to figure that out. because I'm sure he's going to be into something or want to do something. So I don't know. He's super fun, though. He's a lot of fun to hang out with. We're going to go rope here in a little bit, him and I, so. Yeah. We have is fun. It, is it weird um, 
adulting or I guess parenting in the social media world now? Like your job is a lot on social media. Does that, is that hard raising your kids under that? Um, I mean, we just are who we are. I mean, I put a lot of stuff on Facebook and Snapchat and how crazy our life is. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Like I, what I'm most worried about is like my kids and having to make sure they're, you know, like my middle daughter's really into TikTok and like avoiding the dangers of like people contacting them on TikTok. Yeah. She doesn't understand. Uh-huh. Um, so I think that's hard, but as far as just the rest, no, I don't think it's really affected our life any. I mean, we are who we are. We, we kind of live and let live people. We don't, don't really judge anybody else's parenting style. I wanted so to mention different. something. <laughs> you, uh, you put something on Facebook that I thought was hilarious and it was the, all these women looking at their men that, uh, you know, looking at their skinny jeans. Now that there's an epidemic, they're like, Hey, can this guy like cook? Can he like catch a chicken? Can he survive in the wild? It's a good. Yeah, that was funny. I thought that was funny. I don't know. I think like ranch people, ag people, maybe look at this different. We all basically lived quarantine. Quarantine hasn't really changed my life that much. Right. Because we, you know, we work from home anyway. We're at uh-huh. we're on a ranch all the time. You know, we see we see people, but I mean, it's really slowed down our Mexican food consumption that we're all very <laughs> proud of. But. Um, no, I thought that was really funny because it's funny how priorities shift in the world so fast, you know, and I, I posted another one that was like, guys aren't worried anymore about what girl's the prettiest. They're worried about which one can catch a chicken. Um, <laughs> and that's true because, you know, girls are in quarantine and everyone's losing their, their nails and, yeah, you know, they're whatever. And I, I mean, hey, I've had my nails done. I've had eyelash, eyelash extensions. I don't right now, but, you know. I had a moment like that. So right after the whole quarantine thing hit in Utah, there was an earthquake. Um, and I was like, is this the end of times? Like, what is happening? I can't believe this. Um, and I immediately thought like, oh, wait, can I catch an animal? Can I like survive in the woods? Like, I don't have any of those skills. I should have been preparing my whole life for this, you know? Yeah. How could we have known though? I planted a garden the other day just because I was like, if this quarantine goes on any longer, I'm going to have to be able to sustain, sustain my own pico de gallo um, <laughs> habit. So like I literally planted every ingredient of pico de gallo. So that way I'm covered. I don't uh, got to worry about it. I'm covered. Priorities. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. It, it's been a really weird time, especially um, expecting a baby during this time. But, yeah. Um, but it, it's funny because what a time to bring a baby into the world you know like you'll have a great story well when you were born it was in the time of corn i mean yeah it's weird because we're all trying to make light of it but like it's going to be a spot in history it's going to go down in history you know this time that we're living in yeah absolutely actually the hospital that we're going to is the only hospital in utah where the husband is still let in oh wow yeah, so all the other ones, the it's just mom, no dad. Oh wow! Well, ew. but we're lucky. For that. Yeah, we still have. We I can still go in, but um, it's crazy though. In in spite of all this craziness, Zingular's doing better than ever. I mean, people have yeah. stepped up. Yeah, and I think it's there's so many factors leading to that. One, people are home. Um, our two, our activity schedules got cleared. Mm -hmm. Um, three health and wellness has become a huge priority in the world. Um, four people are stuck quarantined with food and they're overeating from stress. Um, and then another thing, there's a lot of people that need help financially. So it all lined up perfectly with our culture and our company, um, which is going to be an explosion, which it is. It's the best enrolling month in history. So, yeah, which is amazing. Um, yeah. How do you keep yourself, you personally, motivated? Like, what drives you at this point? Um, I mean, 
mean, I want to hit gold ambassador. That drives me. Um, I don't know. I like what I do. I like what I do, and I feel like it's my calling, so that makes it easy to get up every day and do it. I, you know, I worked in a lab for 15 years, and I do remember thinking, is this what I was meant for? Is this, is this it for me? Um, no, I mean, numbers drives me. Um, getting progress in my business, seeing people helping build leaders below me really drives me. Um, I mean, you can't see it right now, but if you just look to the left, I have a board here. I have a big whiteboard I keep in my office with my distributors and I have numbers on it that I track every day to see where they are. Um, that really motivates me. It motivates me every time I have to look over there and look at it, you know, to help those people reach their goals. Are you competitive? Oh, horrible. <laughs> I think I knew the horrible answer. Horrible to yeah. the point that if it's Connect Four, like, <laughs> you know how you probably, if you're a parent, should let your kid win some? No. No. Like, if we're playing Connect Four, I'm going to slay you. <laughs> or if it's Hopscotch or Tic-Tac-Toe, like, I'm not going to weaken. Like, you're just going to have to get tough faster. Was your family like that? Siblings, parents? Uh, I don't really remember them being like that. I mean, my dad was into racing cars, so he was competitive that way. And my brother was always racing cars or um, rodeoing, so he was competitive that way. I don't remember us being competitive towards each other. Um, yeah, I don't know why I'm so competitive, but like, it's it's a problem because I'm like, I mean, if it's hopscotch, I'm, I'm taking it serious and I'm going to try to win. <laughs> Have you ever considered taking up like an adult league sport? You know, go play women's lacrosse or something, rugby. You'd be great uh, at it. I've thought about softball, but then I'm like, I don't have time. Yeah. Um, I know I used to be in a pitch club. This is kind of funny. I hope none of, the, none of these women watch it. They probably won't listen to this ever, but. They only let 16 people in and it was in a small town and literally someone had to pass away before you could get in because like it's the same ladies. And I was like the youngest one by 30 years. And I know sometimes they wanted to kick me out because like for them, it was social time. It was like social catch up and eat snacks. And for me, it was like, like we're playing cards. This is my one card night a month. We're playing cards. Get serious. Pay attention. What the small quit, <laughs> quit talking and quit snacking and pay attention to your cards. <laughs> yeah. oh, that is so funny. I've run into that too. Like I, me and my wife, my wife is very competitive as well. She played, uh, she ran track in college and we'll go to like a community or a church activity and play volleyball for fun. And like secretly we're both just fuming that people aren't taking it seriously. You know, I'm like, yeah, trying to have fun, pretending that we're just like, you know, bumping yeah. and setting. But deep down, I'm like, we got to win this. What are you guys doing? Yeah, that's so me, too. So me. Like everything's some kind of competition. And I think healthy competition is good. I do. Yeah. I think if it's as long as it's healthy, it's good. Like, you know, it's not so good when people get ugly or something. Yeah. But yeah, you have you do video games or anything like that in your family? No, we're not big gamers. That's probably mm -hmm. good because that I, we're not gamers either. But I've seen like if you're competitive and you got a family of competitive people, you'll just game. Now, when I was in college, we used to play Mario Kart. Um, my roommates and I would play Mario Kart. Like Mario Kart became the decision maker for everything. Like, <laughs> oh, who's gonna have to go get the pizza? I don't know. Let's play Mario Kart. Oh, oh, we're out of milk. Who's going to go get milk? Okay, we'll play a game of Mario Kart. Loser goes and gets it. So, like, I got super good at Mario Kart. Uh, I, so, that's the one game that me and my wife have, and I'm glad we don't do that because my wife is amazing at it, and I suck. So, I would have to take out the trash every time. Like, I, all the tabs would be on me, probably. <laughs> yeah, you have to be Yoshi. I feel like Yoshi's the fastest one in Mario Kart. And then there's tricks. She's always Yoshi. And I, every time she tells me to be uh, Donkey Kong, and I'm like, are you sure that you have my best interests at heart? Yeah, Donkey Kong's the heaviest. How do you expect him to be the fastest on a cart? He's been hustling me this whole time. And I just found out that you can drift. 
honestly, just oh, like, yeah. like the other day. And so, I, you know, I'm getting 11th every time she's getting first and she's had all these secrets that she hasn't been telling me. That's marriage. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't know which one you're referring to, but ours was like old school, like in 2000, Mario Kart. And like you could cut through one of the mountains and we didn't have like internet all that to teach us these tricks like we had to learn them the hard way you know so i'm sure there's all kinds of tricks now but yeah i just had to get good at mario kart because i never wanted to go get the pizza that's awesome hey um it's been about 40 minutes i know you got to go uh, do you're going off and do something with your son do you have any final words for us imparting your wisdom Oh man, I just think that everyone owes it to themselves to kind of go all in in this business. Like do every single thing that you've heard leaders talk about and see what happens. And I'm just, just know it's going to be uncomfortable. It was a super uncomfortable uh, switch for me too. But if you don't, you're always limited and you MLM didn't fail you. Zingular didn't fail you. You failed yourself because you never went all in. Um, you know, at some point you just gotta like, go for it, you know, mm -hmm. like really go for it, really do the hard things they're asking, but the same things that I thought hard were hard eight years ago. I don't think hard now. I'll put a picture up on social media and I don't care. I don't care. Um, yeah, That's you just. Awesome. You just take a real good inventory of what you're good at and what you're not and attack the things you're not good at. I think what people do is they like to repeat the things they are good at because that's easy, that's yeah. comfortable. Mm -hmm. But you have to make a list of I, and that's like a gut check because you have to be super real with yourself and say, it's a lot, it's holding a mirror up to your face and saying, okay, you're not so good at that. And then just really attacking it to get better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if people are interested in, in joining your team, being part of the business, all that, how, how can they reach you? Um, so you can find me on Facebook, just Robin Packard, or there's a Robin Packard Zingular on Facebook and message me through there. It's probably the easiest way. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to talk to anybody about it, about it. And it's definitely my passion. I feel like the time we live in right now was made for our culture, for us to help people. I love that. That's awesome. Robin, again, thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. if we need reach out. I, I'd love, I don't know how I could help, but uh, I'd love to help. Well, same to you and good luck with that baby. I'm excited for you. Thanks so much. Talk to you later. Thank, Robin. You. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.